this session. I'd like to thank NIADA for hosting today's webinar and allowing us to share Pain and Me's consumer research on why consumers pay late. In today's session, we'll discuss key themes revealed by the research and uncover trends and attitudes around late bill payments, as well as, as explore payment options that younger payers want. Uh, we're also going to touch upon the latest uh, alternative mobile payment methods and share some adoption results with aggregated data across 40 buy here, pay here dealers. Uh, this is set, the session will conclude with some practical recommendations on how to drive more on-time payments and increase customer satisfaction. My name is Bruce Gaskill. I'm the Senior Director of Partnerships at Pay Near Me. A little background is I started selling online payments 25 years ago when the dial-up modem was the primary way to connect to the internet. Uh, most people know me as the 7-Eleven guy as I started at Pay Near Me nine years ago when we had one solution, which was cash at retail, and we had set up a network of local convenience stores. Um, for today's agenda, we're going to discuss how we conducted this research. Uh, combining both pay near me and third party data. We're going to talk just high level about some of the cascading economic impacts of late payments. You know, scare you a little bit, I guess. <laughs> we also want to talk about how consumers grade themselves and what consumer segment is most likely to pay late. We're going to break it down to what how younger consumers bank and how that impacts the payment options they prefer. And then we're gonna conclude with some practical ideas that will result in more on-time payments. So about the research, PaynerMe pulled 2,600 consumers and asked them 30 questions about their preferences towards bill pay. Um, this survey hit US adults across different demographics and a representative sample of the US population. We then applied filters to slice by age, geography, income, and device. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll give you a QR code that you can scan and you can download this research and share it with others in your organization. So to get a sense of who's participating today, we'll take a quick poll and just ask, you know, what percentage of your customers are even just slightly late on their payment at any given time? So this doesn't mean two weeks or 30 days. This could just mean it's the end of the month and what percentage of your payments are gonna be at least one day late. So take a few seconds to complete the poll. Very good. Um, so it looks like we have a mix of pollers who say less than 10% of their customers pay late, which if you're in the buy here, pay here space is amazing. And then we have um, a group that says that more than 40% of their customers are late at any given time, which um, is you know fairly consistent with subprime lending. The, the question then becomes, how much business benefit could you gain if we were to reduce your, your late payments from 40% to, say, 30%? Uh, I suspect that the impact would be material. So what are some of the cascading costs as they relate to late payments? Um, the obvious one is just restricted cash flow. The most immediate result is a late payment, even a couple days late, can, for smaller business, impact payroll and daily operating expenses. Um, additionally, many small businesses have to open lines of credit. Said differently, they're borrowing money and paying business, paying interest to operate their business based on uh unpredictable cash flow. And then 
for lenders, late payments can impact your cost of capital. So uh, as you go out and borrow money to lend to your customers, your cost of funds gets larger as your portfolio of payments is late. From an operational standpoint, there's the, the cost of collecting. Even just a slight reduction in late payments can save in calling, emailing, texting, and exhausting other means, which would be unnecessary um, when you're trying to collect from a pool of customers who would have paid anyway. Um, if they would have paid, if you had solved some of their challenges, um, you've basically wasted that time and effort that could have been spent working on customers with greater needs where they can't pay because they don't have the money or they have a personal finance issue. Uh, certainly the opportunity cost. So the first opportunity cost is if you're manning the phones and you're processing inbound payments, you're not focused on outbound collections, which basically means that on payday, your late paying customers get a pass. Um, additionally, QuickBooks survey indicated that 90% of businesses said customers paying late has set their company's long-term growth plans behind. So uh, it prevents future growth. Additionally, for severely late payments, um, you result into asset recovery. And, you know, the challenge becomes as they start to get um, late on one or more payments, it becomes more and more difficult to, for them to catch up. So anything that you can do to keep your best customers on time um, has many pluses. Um, repossessing, repossession and reconditioning has downstream costs, including write-offs and recovery that happens over a long period of time. I think the, the true challenge with late payments is you don't know which of the late payments are going to cascade into some of these larger downstream business challenges. Um, many could just be accidental or temporary. Uh, and the purpose of this study is to understand who pays late, what are some of the reasons, um, what potential solutions can you provide to minimize the impact, and then um, apply these learned technologies or learned assets, focusing on squeezing this late payer funnel into a smaller and smaller group of, of good on-time payers. So the first section that we're gonna to cover today covers the burning question, who's paying late? And again, this is a cross section of the US, but I think the, the most eye-opening answer is that um, most people acknowledge that they pay their bills late. In fact, 51% of consumers say that they paid a bill late over the course of the year. 30% um, pay late three times a year and 18% pay bills late almost monthly. And this is national at all income levels, geography, and age group. It's not something that's specific to non-prime lenders. When looking at these demographics by age, we see even more interesting, interesting trends. Uh, it may not surprise you that 92% of individuals ages 60 and over pay bills late less than three times a year. However, adults 44 and younger are four times more likely to pay late than their older generation. Um, the data shows that younger adults score themselves lower on average when it comes to paying their bills on time. So this is, this is their opinion of themselves. Does area of the country matter? Absolutely. Uh, Lending Tree did a study and they compared 1.4 million anonymized credit reports from a hundred of the largest metropolitan areas in order to find out which areas have the most success when it comes to paying bills on time or which areas struggle most. And, you know, looking at the, the data up on the screen with red representing late payments and green representing on-time payments, it's pretty clear that, um, that the 
um, Northeast and the West have uh, better customer demographics when it comes to on-time payments. But if you're located in any of the, the states that are marked red or brown, um, you're dealing with a customer segment that, that um, even Lending Tree has shown has historically had trouble paying their bills on time. So we're going to have another poll here and excluding the obvious, which is I don't have the money or I lost my job. Um, what do you think consumers said was the number one reason they pay late? We'll give everybody a chance to chime in on what, what consumers say is the number one reason. And the votes are still coming in. All right, well, we're still collecting the data. Let's go ahead and show the results. So drum roll, based on consumer feedback, the number one reason that customers paid late was, sorry, having a little technical challenge here. The number one reason was I procrastinated or forgot. Um, looking at the survey, it seems that uh, that the business owners and the collectors on this call recognize that as a, as a major reason why people don't pay bills on time. It surprised me because I never pay bills. Like I always pay my bills on time, but I'm very um, much of a perfectionist. Now, keeping in mind that consumers are asked to check all that apply, other big reasons were, well, I, I overlooked the bill that came in the mail or in the email. Uh, I got frustrated with the complicated online process or, um, you know, I was waiting on hold and, and decided to hang up and call back later. 20% um, said that just keeping track of the due date and the amount due is difficult. Um, still, one of the largest segments, 30% of consumers said, yeah, I, I didn't have enough money or I lost my job. So that one still uh, rang strong, but, um, you know, except for that one reason, I lost my job or I don't have the money. It feels that there should be ways to help our customers fix many of these concerns or complaints. And if you do fix them, your customers will love you. What we found interesting is more than half of the people surveyed gave themselves a grade of C or lower when knowing when their bills were due. Adults younger than 45 were more likely to pay bills, or four times more likely to pay their bills late than, um, than their older segment. 30% um, of 18 to 29 say they pay their bills late, and 25% ages 30 to 44 um, say that they've paid their bills late. Again, um, individuals ages 60 and over showed a much um, higher likelihood of paying bills on time. In fact, 92% said they pay fewer than three bills late in any year. When we drill down into some of the root causes, nearly half of the consumers stated they feel disorganized and stressed when it comes to managing paying their bills. Things like keeping track of their account number, the due date, passwords, um, even phone numbers to call are the main culprit. And surprisingly, most of the reasons for late payments were not due to lack of money, but instead disorganization and stress due to the time it takes to complete complicated bill pay processes. Um, you know, the top line is 52% struggle to remember account numbers, logins, and passwords. So we'll take the aggregate data and we'll break it down to how this impacts younger consumers. For younger payers, the disorganization is much greater. When looking at late payments for this age group, we sometimes see interesting trends. Um, 
11% said they paid late nearly every month. If we start to roll the numbers up, 30% pay late six times a year and 50% pay late um, at least once per quarter. And delinquencies are high despite this group having the fewest bills to pay. Um, this group acknowledged they have a problem uh, when completing the survey. Uh, and the research also uncovers why they have a problem and how billers can help. First, knowing how youth interact with finance in a very digitally heavy way helps us understand what makes bill paying so hard. A recurring theme from the research is nearly 40% of people ages 18 to 29 say they're disorganized. Anecdotally, this makes sense. This generation grew up with a connected reminder in their pocket at all times. Many came of age with the rise of the smartphone and having information on demand. So naturally, the need to remember things like due dates or amounts owed is less prominent for them. The younger generation was disproportionately ahead of others in sharing their difficulties, leading in four of the six main categories for late payments presented. Um, more than half had trouble with due dates. This contrast with the 60 and older group were only 23% shared a similar challenge. A full third struggled with knowing how much they owe. Another third had trouble with navigating websites with poor uh, user experiences. And this is a symptom of having to deal with the perils of web 1.0. Um, I call it the pre-iPhone pinch and zoom struggle. I think we've all experienced it. So for a buy here, pay here dealer, it's helpful to first understand the financial landscape of this young consumer ages 18 to 29, as you're engaging them more and more. Um, as a primer, we're gonna hone in on how this youngest generation participates in personal finance. And that starts with their view on banking. It helps to picture why they might be paying late. And if your payment channels are not in line with their expectations, um, maybe that's part of the challenge. Digital banks. A growing number of young consumers are flocking to digital banking as their primary financial institution. These digital banks exist primarily on a mobile device. They are often lacking physical branches and face-to-face -face employee interactions. And as consumers move to digital banks, the expectation for mobile-first digital experiences grows with it. Um, being mobile first will no longer be an advantage. However, having a lackluster mobile experience will likely be a deal breaker for this audience. Another area is mobile wallets, and this one's huge. In addition to digital banking, your consumers are very comfortable with mobile wallets, such as PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. Business Insider reported that 50% of Gen Zs use digital wallets each month, and over 75% use some sort of digital payment, including P2P money movement. Um, prepaid debit cards are declining as employers are starting to deposit to online banks like Cash App. Not surprising, Cash App announced in February 2023 they're launching a Cash App savings account. In fact, some younger consumers have replaced banking with these apps. In recent Cornerstone Advisory study, 8% of Gen Zers are now calling PayPal their primary checking account provider, and 4% and growing are applying that label to Cash App. Location also plays a role in mobile wallet preference. Check out this clear split in consumer interest for Venmo and Cash App based on geographic lines. Did you know that in the top five states where Cash App is the most popular, also align with the bottom 10 states for average credit score? Um, this could have interesting implications on people that are serving non-prime borrowers. You know, it's also worth noting that there is a correlation here um, between uh, cash apps adoption, um, non-prime borrowers, and the fact that um, 
these mobile wallets are tra treated as good funds. And these monies are trapped either in Cash App or PayPal unless you have an easy way to accept them. Um, said differently, other billers that accept Cash App or PayPal may be getting paid where you're missing out. Also, there's some good news here for youth consumers is attitudes toward auto pay are great. Um, youth 18 to 29 said that they had a higher likelihood of setting up automatic payments with 31% said they use auto pay for all recurring bills. And then more than half or 52% say they've set up auto pay for at least some of their recurring bills. So this was the highest amongst um, every survey group. However, for those who don't sign up for auto pay, there's some interesting differences across generations. Um, for the group that doesn't sign up for auto pay, again, 18 to 29, um, who have concerns, uh, the biggest concern is around overdraft fee. Uh, and this is a concern by a large margin. 40% of the people said they have concerns about overdraft um, versus other segments ages 30 to 44 were only 9% had concern with overdraft and ages 45 and over um, roughly 14%. For this group that had concerns, the number one issue was control. They want to control how and when the money comes out. So, um, you know, going beyond basic auto pay that's set up during the, the vehicle sale or new loan origination, Having other ways for consumers to set up auto pay um, can help you increase adoption of, of this very attractive way of driving self-service. And then where does cash play in? Um, do younger payers still like cash? The answer is yes. Um, in a gig economy, many young people receive part of their income in cash, 35% um, ages 18 to 29 said they'd be likely to pay their bills in cash if offered compared with 26% um, across all customer demographics. Um, if you only accept debit and ACH, then these cash preferred consumers have to pay a retailer a fee to load cash onto a prepaid debit card, which then can lead to procrastination and late payments. Uh, if you charge a convenience fee for debit card payments, and then the, cust then the customer ends up paying two fees. Um, they end up paying one fee to the retailer to put cash onto the prepaid debit card, and they may end up paying another fee to you. Uh, worse is sometimes the prepaid debit cards get declined, trapping the borrower's money on the card, and they have no way to pay you. So, you know, the footnote is cash still remains a viable bill payment option, uh, but it doesn't typically eat into digital tender types. Um, the question is, is, how do you automate cash and how do you reduce your operating expense in servicing these cash customers? So we were able to share with you a lot about what consumers have to say. Um, now we're gonna share with you some practical advice on how to alleviate some of this disorganization and procrastination and cast the widest possible net to get on-time payments. So one of the actionable recommendations has to do with um, some strategies you can implement to guide your customers to making more on-time payments. Um, if you have a smartphone handy, you'll see there's a QR code in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Um, feel free to get out your camera and scan it, and you can follow along with a, a new type of bill pay experience. Um, if you're observing the screen and you look in the right-hand corner, you'll see something that says, warning, your account's past due. Click here to make a payment. I guess that's an appropriate type of warning on a why consumers pay late webinar, but... Um, what you see there is something called a smart link. Many companies provide them nowadays. And when you click on these links, it automatically logs you into the biller's portal where you can see things like um, the amount due and the due date, eliminating two of the customer's primary objections. 
And then if they've used it before, there'll be saved cards there. And so they can just select a tender type and complete a payment in less than a minute. So again, going back to our research, 41% say keeping track of the due dates is a challenge and 45% say a timely reminder would make things easier. But if it's not delivered to or integrated to their smartphone, the reminders are not very helpful. Uh, when we talk to merchants, the most common call to action in a text message is for the consumer to call into the dealer, at which time, if it's payday, they have to wait on hold, which is costing them time and it's costing you time and money. Um, or if there is a link embedded in there, it's just a typical website where they have to use their pinch and zoom skills and still enter in a user ID, password, or account number. Um, said differently, if your reminder takes too long, again, the attention span of a lot of these consumers is very short, what, what could happen is they get dist distracted, they procrastinate, and they forget. So um, look in the market for technologies like the Smart Link where they exist, and it's effectively pushing the payment portal directly to their smartphone, allowing one click to pay using a saved card on their, on their phone. Um, and we have seen a business benefit of a 90% reduction of inbound calls. So now you can focus on outbound calls um, and certainly more on-time payments. The other option is give your customers more choices. Um, 29 to 30% say they want more payment choices, but this doesn't mean, you know, Visa, MasterCard, or, or even adding Discover or American Express. What it means is they want um, digital wallet options like Apple Pay and Google Pay or PayPal or Venmo, even Cash App. Um, and so, you know, uh, we recommend that you poll your customers and ask if these options are important. You might be surprised what they tell you. Uh, we certainly were. We hear a lot of discussion about, should I develop a mobile app that we customer can download from the app store? And uh, you know, our advice is use the native wallet built into the phone. Um, the native wallet, such as the ones found in iOS or Android devices, address all of the key stressors like remembering due dates, amounts due, account numbers, and, and even more. Um, if the great thing about the mobile wallet technology is if the consumer changes phones, all of the content that was in their mobile wallet follows them from device to device, so you'd never lose that connection. Again, uh, the mobile wallet is just integrated with the phone's operating system and the customer's not asked to download anything through the app store or any other type of app. Here's an interesting one. Have you ever accepted a debit card payment from anyone other than your customer, like a friend or family member, only later to regret that decision because you receive a chargeback? Well, the root cause is typically relationship breakup, or the borrower never paid their friend or family member in what should have been a loan, um, which later got perceived as a gift. I know because this scenario plays out on Judge Judy every week. Um, this is a problem as old as time, but you, the lender, end up having one or more payments charged back with no recourse as you never had a contract with the friend or family member cardholder. Um, you may not have been aware of this, but P2P money transfers like Apple Cash, Venmo, or PayPal is safer than taking a friend's card because first, um, it requires a pen or biometric authorization when sending money from one friend to another um, as the you know, sender authorizes the funding to the receiver. Uh, the other thing that most people don't understand is that P2P money transfers are final. So if your borrower receives money from their roommate via a P2P wallet transfer or a family member, 
and then the borrower elects to use those funds to pay you, then the roommate who or family member who loaned them the money has no ability to charge you back. So, um, you know, effectively their recourse is with your borrower, not with you. Additionally, if the borrower pays you with money out of their digital wallet, they too use biometrics or pen-based authorization before releasing those funds to you, which is very difficult to dispute with your bank if you're the consumer charging it back to the biller. So this is a great tip um, in accepting mobile wallet payments. Also auto pay. Um, the most traditional way to set up auto pay is using a form during loan origination or during a welcome call as a customer is uh, being transferred to you to service their loans. But, you know, roughly half of consumers say that, that they want control. And so, you know, there are options out there where you can either set up the auto pay on behalf of the consumer and the biller keeps the control. But for those who otherwise wouldn't sign up, encourage them to sign up on their own. And our observations is that you can increase auto pay by 20% or more if you give these control people the control they're asking for. And certainly nothing beats auto pay for getting on-time payments. Um, cash at retail. I mean, I've, I've been here for nine or 14 years and there's plenty of competitors to us. Um, do you have a cash at retail solution? Um, were you aware that cash at retail is guaranteed funds, meaning a consumer that got a valid receipt from a retailer cannot charge you back? Uh, they can't dispute the transaction or return it. Um, you know, we'll show you some data that a large percentage of our buy here, pay here customers um, receive payments that were presented to a CVS or Walmart or 7-Eleven cashier. And um, customers, you know, clients use cash to retail locations um, when all else fails, when it comes to unlocking GPS ignitions or preventing a repo, repo quite frankly, because cash is good funds, it's guaranteed. Um, there are convenient ways for your customers to pay with cash. Some of them cost the same or less than processing a payment through debit card. And, um, you know, in many cases, they're going to drive past um, five convenience stores before they get back to your dealership. So, you know, cash at retail is a very viable op option. So don't take our word for it. Um, the proof is in the adoption. In front of you is a breakdown of transactions by tender type meaning card, ACH, cash taken at a retailer, as well as digital wallet payments. And this is aggregate data pulled from 40 buy here, pay here dealers using um, DMS systems like AutoMaster, DealPack, and IDMS. This is a large sample size. It represents in one month, 140,000 transactions or $42 million process. Now, looking at it initially, I wasn't surprised to see that 80% of the payments were debit and ACH, which you know, in non-prime auto lending, ACH was a very small portion of the payments because um, it's not good funds, meaning with ACH, you can get a charge back a few days, or you can get a um, NSF a few days later. Uh, it's not like a debit card where when you get that authorization, you know it's good. Um, what I was surprised to see was 13% of the 140,000 transactions were cash taken at a local retailer. And even more interesting, 7% was through a digital wallet, uh, specifically Apple Pay and Google Pay. Um, this is before we launched PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App, which uh, we're making all of these digital wallet capabilities available this quarter. Also, uh, we analyzed all of our debit card transactions across our entire network. And I was surprised to learn that 4.3% of debit cards we process were issued by Cash App. Um, that demonstrates a huge pent up demand for Cash App. Uh, gig workers are now getting paid with these digital wallet technologies in lieu of cash. You know, my 
my gardener, I pay him through um, Venmo. Uh, I imagine he's got a truck payment. Uh, he'd probably appreciate it if, if his lender accepted Venmo. Um, I don't know if you accept digital wallet payments, but uh, if you're not, are you leaving money on the table? So, you know, today we've talked to you about physical wallet payments. So cash in your physical wallet and cards in your physical wallet. We talked about um, digital wallet payments, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, Apple Pay, Google Pay. Um, the idea is, you know, if you send out friendly reminders and you um, accept as many possible tender types as, as customers want, um, it helps increase on-time payments. So I'll do a quick recap and then I'll give you the option to ask questions while you download this research. Um, and sorry, I have something in the screen I can't see. Um, clearly late payments have a cascading negative effect on your business, having real hard and soft costs. Um, for consumers, procrastination and forgetfulness lead to the list of the reasons that they pay late. Um, also, you know, lack of funds or loss of employment, but there's not much you can do about that. The newer generation of bill payers are in a distant train. I mean, they're in the market, they're 18 to 29 years old, so um, you need to be ready to service them. Stress in the bill pay process comes from their disorganization, which leads to late payments and other negative outcomes. Um, accepting just debit or just debit and ACH uh, will increase on time payments if you offer more ways to pay. Um, simple, stress-free, intuitive. Um, these are the things, the attributes you should be looking for. Uh, understand that people 18 to 29 have expectations around digital wallet capabilities. So take inventory and see what you offer. And, um, you know, it's likely if you're not accepting digital wallet currency, uh, they do have money they can pay you, but it's trapped in these tender types that you're unable to accept. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, allow folks the opportunity to uh, scan the QR code and, and get access to this, this research. You'll find there's three research papers out there around why consumers pay late. And uh, we will open up for questions via chat. Great. And, uh, yeah, no, thank you, Bruce. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, we did get some questions that came in as you were talking. So if it's okay, I'm gonna tee off a couple of the questions to begin with. Okay. Um, and one of them was, you know, whether or not the research reports could be emailed out to the, to the panelists. And absolutely, not only using this, um, scanning the QR code here, but um, following this webinar, you'll receive an email um, with a copy of one of the uh, with the reports that um, the, the data that came from that Bruce presented on the during the webinar. So one of the questions is, which dealer management systems do you integrate with? Now, that's a great question. So in the buy here, pay here space, we work with AutoMaster, um, Solera IDMS, uh, DealPack, in the um, in the subprime lending space, we work with Megasys and Shaw and Northridge, and um, just signed an agreement with Alliance Data Systems. Um, we're not yet working with um, companies like Wayne Reeves and Fraser, um, but we are working with some of the the LMSs that service the larger buy here pay here's for sure. Great, thank you for that. Do you have any recommendations on simplifying the auto pay sign up process? Yeah, so the traditional method is collecting a form with an authorization signature written on it. Um, there are some newer ways to do it. One of the technologies that we innovated, we call it um, tell to web authorization. So it's long, um, NACHA has long accepted a digital signature if somebody goes online and and fills out a form and, and completes uh, an online request for auto pay. But that doesn't help the collector um, who 
you know, has to hope and wait for the customer to fill out that form. So one of the things that we did is we allow either in person or over the phone um, collection of that authorization where you put in the frequency weekly, twice monthly, monthly, and a lot of variations in between. You select the amount and the account in which the, the payment's going to be drawn from. And then um, you proactively send what's called an authorization link directly to the consumer smartphone. And when they click on it, they see everything that the collector um, set up for them. So they could be in person at the dealership, sitting across the table, looking at their phone, or it could be somebody that's remote and they're looking at their phone and it'll show them everything you configured, including the dates and the amounts and the frequency. And all they have to do is click an I authorize button. And within you know 60 seconds, you've accomplished digitally what has historically been done using a filing cabinet and a paper-based authorization system. So it's um, some of our largest customers love that because they've seen huge upticks in, in auto pay adoption simply because it's so easy. Sure, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, there was another question in uh, on the Q&A panel. Um, how is Pay Near Me's, ca how, how does Pay Near Me's cash option work? If you could review that. Yeah, um, short of changing the content on the screen, I'll describe it in your mind's eye. So a, a decade ago, we created this process where we link a barcode to a loan. So if you had a thousand loans, imagine that there's a thousand unique barcodes. And then we have uh, we load those barcodes into the retailer's point of sale system long before a consumer ever shows up. We call that staging. Now, um, for customers like um, Tricolor that has 10,000 cash payers, what they do is they click on the smart link. They see all the different ways to pay. They choose pay with cash. They see a list of retailers displayed on their smartphone. They select Walmart or CVS or 7-Eleven, and they have a, a UPC barcode like you'd see on a candy bar or a bottle of water displayed right on the glass screen of their mobile phone. They then walk up to any cashier at any register, show that barcode, the cashier scans it, and any amount they pay is posted perfectly back to the correct account every time. Um, just to give you a sense of how accurate it is, um, we process a million cash transactions a month yet, and we take calls directly from consumers and we're able to handle the inbound calls from a million payments a month with less than a dozen customer service reps um, answering the phone within 30 seconds or less. So it's operationally quiet. Um, scanning the machine readable value of the barcode is operationally perfect. And the payment is guaranteed funds, meaning we'll instantly update your loan management system with that receipt. And the money shows up in your account uh, a day or two later. And there's no concept of a chargeback or a dispute. It's cash. It's good money. That's, that's awesome. Very cool. Um, one more question. Um, can you brand or personalize the mobile wallet through Pay Near Me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Our brand is always at the far bottom of the screen, it's a little thing that says powered by pay near me. Um, your brand is always first and foremost, whether it's um, through the mobile web flow or the integrated mobile wallet. So uh, when you download the wallet and you look in your smartphone, you'll see things like your Walgreens loyalty card, your um, ABC bank debit card, but you'll also see um, ABC buy here, pay here, right as the top choice. And if you have more than one um, wallet, maybe you pay your child support through Pay Near Me and you pay your car payment through Pay Near Me, you'll just flip through, oh, here's the utility one, here's the car payment one, here's the child support payment one. They're all uh, custom branded wallets uh, uh, for the merchant. So. Um, your brand is permanently installed on the customer smartphone. Very good. 
We did have one more question come in. Um, if anyone else has any further questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. If we don't get to them on this webinar, we'll definitely email you the responses afterwards. Um, but when we talked about uh, reasons why people do not pay on time, uh, overcoming procrastination, forgetfulness, what suggestions do you have to help customers overcome that excuse or that reason why they're not paying on time? Sure. So uh, we have built, and, I'm, and many other payment processors have built technology called engagements. Um, some of these technologies only engage customers through one channel, which is typically text. They'll send a text reminder. Um, we've built engagements so that they work across multiple channels. So we track in our system whether the customer's preference is their mobile wallet or text or email. And there's different rules for each of those channels of engagement. And what'll end up happening is um, we get a daily file from the loan management system that shows all the accounts and all the amounts and all the due dates. And we scan them every morning and we look for things like the bills due today or the bills one day past due. And then we send out different types of communications, um, the right message to the right customer at the right time in the right language. So we, we translate into um, either English or Spanish, depending on the customer's preference. And um, uh, this is like a virtual collector. These customers are familiar with the reminder on their phone. They're familiar with the, with the mobile wallet buzzing in their purse or wallet. They're familiar with getting the text message. And then the next step is to remove as much friction as possible from them completing that action of making a payment. And all of our reminders have something called a smart link where when they click on it, they're immediately logged into the payment portal. There's no need to know their account number. We knew that when they signed up for the engagement and they click on that one link They'll see the information they need to see. They're comfortable with it. They feel good about it. They see your brand. Your, they'll, they'll see they, you know, their Chevy Equinox. And um, there's a button that says, um, make a one-time payment. And they'll see all their saved cards. And they can just pick the card that they want or go to a 7-Eleven on the weekend and pay with cash. And, and we immediately notify you of the receipt of that payment. So... Um, gentle reminders and frictionless customer experience are the two things that uh, eliminate procrastination. Wonderful. Thank you again, Bruce. Really appreciate you spending the time with um, our members today on this webinar. I appreciate everyone that did tune in live. Um, as you exit the webinar today, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We'd appreciate it if you could complete that. We you definitely um, want your feedback um so that we can continue to improve and offer more webinars like this one so again thank you everyone for attending and if you have any further questions you can always reach out to niada just email learn l-e-a-r-n at niada.com thanks and have a great day everyone